Powders of metals have been used to create shapes by a number of different approaches before 3D printing came around. And so it's because of the existence of many of these processes that you have had a chance to have a wide range of chemistries available for 3D printing. One traditional powder metallurgy method is just pour the powder into a mold, compact under high pressure, take out the green part and heat it to sinter bond between the particles and then get have some finishing operations. Alternatively, you can take the powder, create a shape, such as an injection molding, and then you center densify, and then you have finishing operations. In a hybrid process, you can take the powder and apply pressure and temperature at the same time, and hot isostatic press, uh, hot isostatic pressing is, a, is hip, is an example of such a process. You complete the consolidation and densification at the same time, and then you get the net dimensions based on finishing operations. In this map is a plot of traditional processes that have used metal powders. On the y-axis, the typical particle sizes that are used for each of these processes. One thing that is evident from this plot is that there is a preferred particle size range for any given manufacturing method. This is no different for 3D printing. So for laser powder bed processes, for instance, a medium particle size of about 30 microns and a distribution that is narrow with a width of plus or minus 15 microns is typically used for a lot of laser powder bed methods. For EB uh, melting, on the other hand, you have something between 50 to 100 microns in particle sizes. So gives you an idea that for the specific process, you need to have a good handle on what might be the um, best way to go about um, choosing and specifying particle size range. For binder jetting, for instance, you would end up having particle sizes below 10 microns similar closer to what you would see during for metal injection molding. Sintering is a thermal process where atoms begin to diffuse from one powder surface to another powder surface, create bonds, improve strength, and promote densification. Here's a plot of the fractional density as a function of temperature for nickel powder plotted for three different particle sizes. One thing you can see is density increases as temperature increases. So there's more thermal energy that allows for consolidation. Also, surface area plays a big role. Uh, there's surface energy and its minimization is a driving force for atomic motion to occur. Finer powders center densify to a greater extent at any given temperature. These have important ramifications as we look at 3D printing processes as well. If you have a regular powder shape, such as a sphere, you can specify particle size based on the diameter of the sphere. But if you have an irregular particle size or an irregular particle, then how do you prescribe what is the size? Is it this diameter? Is it that? Is it that? How do we know? So there are many possible measures. It's based on dimensions, width or height. It's based on area. It's based on volume occupied. It's based on mass, based on projected area as a random length assignment or the largest dimension. Understanding the basis for measuring and reporting particle sizes is important. There are many different characterization techniques for measuring particle size. We said that particle size could be important, affects many different shape, uh, a, a, a very uh, affects many different shaping factors. Here is an example of a number of different particle size uh, characterization methods. On the y-axis, X-rays, light scattering methods, sedimentation methods, serving methods, and microscopy methods. On the x-axis is the actual particle size that can be measured by any given technique. So it's clear that there's again a sp sweet spot of which techniques are better capable for measuring particle size in different ranges. So for instance, x-rays can be used for much finer particles and sedimentation techniques, gravitational and other, can probably be me measured for coarser particles. Right? 
light scattering again occurs in depending upon the wavelength of light in uh, some intermediate me measuring method so these are important to understand as you go forward for module 3 which are metal powders you're typically re dealing with powders in this type of a range over here and so light scattering methods come in to be very useful when you're using ceramic particles you're using submicron particles and so you have to go into this range over here for uh, measuring um, particle size attributes that would be the case for module 4 since they're easy to understand you have wires that are placed at a certain spacing depending upon the spacing and depending upon the particle size of the powder as you decrease the spacing you can have particles that are of a finer particle go through that cell and so you will be able to map out the entire distribution if you had a range of different cells so one of my former students Mariam measuring this particle size using this so again you see depending upon size of the opening as the mesh size specification goes up the opening size goes down the mesh size being measured by the number of wires that are present in the cell per inch so smaller the mesh size larger the opening you also typically will have statements such as a minus mesh such as a minus 100 mesh that means powders smaller than this 100 mesh which is 150 micron opening will be able to go through that mesh so that means all particles below 150 microns can be represented by the term minus 100 mesh consequently a plus 100 mesh means all particles larger than 150 microns can be collected based on what is retained inside that cell laser light scattering is another approach for being able to measure particle size you have a stream of particles injected and there is a laser beam normal to that flow uh, that's present the interaction of the laser beam with the particles scatters light and you have a number of uh, detectors available to measure the intensity of light and there is there are physical treatments that allow to correlate the change in intensity the extent of scatter based on the particle size and the particle size distribution and so it is possible to get a particle size distribution based on laser light scattering size of disturbance is proportional to particle size in this case irrespective of the powder production method you can have a large distribution of particle sizes that can be produced during the powder production method let's say atomization depending upon process parameters the nature of that distribution can change but as we talked about earlier there is a sweet spot for each 3d printing technique on what are useful particle size distribution ranges and so for instance for laser light powder bed fusion you are in this range between about 15 to 45 microns right so what happens to all this other material that is being produced for instance right what do you do with that so the production cost is for the whole size distribution and if you're only going to use a small fraction of that you will still end up having to absorb the cost of all these other size ranges this gives an idea of why 3d printing powders cost a lot more than perhaps for other techniques 